Peter Sanatello is a former entrepreneur and is currently an independent filmmaker. He has produced documentaries in a wide variety of countries such as Ukraine, Iran, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Saudi Arabia, India, and more. With that, I would like to welcome Peter Sanatello to the Geoeconomics Podcast. So I was wondering, maybe you could tell us a bit about your channel and how you got it started. Sure. My name is Peter Santanello, and the whole the whole point of the sh- channel is to show, let's say, Americans and Westerners uh, that the world isn't dangerous. And so it started probably from my childhood, where I was told the world was dangerous. We didn't travel at all as a family. I was always interested in what the world was like. And at 24. To 26, I went around the world for two years. I made it a goal, saved money for three years, went around the world for two years, saw all these countries, came home, got in conversations with people, and I was often asked, where did you like? Where was interesting? And I would say things like, oh, the Republic of Georgia was, was amazing, or Tajikistan. And I just had all these puzzled looks, but not in a in an inquisitive, positive way and more like, why would you go there? Look, and I realized the gap of information, especially in my generation, it was just, you know, most of the world was a negative, dangerous hole. You know, you have places like France or England that were go to zones, let's say for vacation. But other than that, most of the world was presented in a negative light, obviously through the news. So I thought, wow, I really want to show what I've experienced to people that aren't going to be able to see that. So that's the basic premise behind what I do. So I go to countries you, that most most people think are dangerous, basically. Right. So why do you think that um, um, Americans and Western Europeans have this bias that the world is such a dangerous place? How did this start and uh, how did it develop? Well, growing up in the States, in my generation, okay, I'm 42, so you know, in elementary school in the 80s, uh, you know, you're basically told you're number, you're number one, America has everything. There's no reason really to go explore because your country's massive. There's a lot in it. And the world's a pretty dangerous place. I mean, that's what the new, the messages you get objectively or, you know, like directly or indirectly through your teachers, through the media, through your parents, through all the you know, more mature, let's call it quotation uh, influences, right? And I think it's just that I, it's America's isolated geographically, right? And it influences its own self through its own culture, its own media, its own sports. It's, it's very much its own world. And um, yeah, it's just, there wasn't much information about the rest of the world. So I think that is just, you know, a byproduct of, of not having much, much exposure, I guess. So you think it's more of a um, of like an incidental thing rather than an intentional thing? Yeah, I don't think there's anyone behind the levers necessarily saying, hey, we have to keep all these Americans in the dark about the world. I think the news works in sound bites and things blowing up and, you know, negative emotional triggers, which, you know, are going to happen in places, you know, in the Middle East or where things aren't going so great politically or geopolitically. And this is what gets attention, right? So there might be some, you know, Hollywood, you can say, has a big part in it too, right? With, you know, portraying the world in a negative way. The American is always the hero. Hollywood and Washington have a deep connection. So maybe it's there's some of it's designed, but I think a lot of it is you just see Siri on the news enough time and there's always, there are always negative adjectives around it and you're busy in your life and you have kids and you're working – 50 hours a week and you don't have time to dig into what Siri is about or anything else about it other than what you hear or see. And I think it's like comes in at a subjective, um, not a subjective, but like a, like almost it infiltrates our our minds in a covert way where it's just, you know, you hear it enough time, you hear a word enough time, terrorism around a a country, then you're going to think something negative. I think it's somewhat, it, it, it could be broken down a few different ways, but I don't think, it's like 100% designed by the state or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I've always suspected, though, especially concerning, like, former Soviet states, that it might be some Cold War or, like, immediately post-Cold War sort of residual propaganda. 
And and in fact, that's that's sort of a topic that I want to discuss a bit more because I know that you have a lot of experience um, going to the Cold War. And uh, so maybe we could start. What's your favorite sort of post-Soviet state that you've been to? Uh, well, I think if you want to see a, a, a country that has just a lot in it, in a small space, it would be Georgia, the Republic of Georgia, because you have an old city, Tbilisi. You have the Caucasus Mountains, which are stunning. You have the Black Sea, which is blue with dolphins. You have wine culture. You have beautiful landscapes. You have hospitable people and great food. So that's that would be a nice, like if someone wanted to travel, hey, I want to you know scratch the former Soviet Union and see something very interesting. I got two weeks. I, I would recommend Georgia. I live in Ukraine. I like Ukraine a lot. I think it's uh, Kiev is an interesting city, and it's on the you know it's on the edge of of Europe really. So it has, it takes, it sort of has paganism baked into its, its, uh, men, the mentality there. Yes, it's an Orthodox country, but there are, there, are, there are a lot of superstitions that people live by. There are a lot of interesting rituals. Um, it's different enough where it's interesting, I would say. Where if I go to Western Europe, I'm in Portugal at the moment, it's nice. It's, it's cool. It's interesting, but it's not Nothing's going to really press my mind, let's say, versus when you get into the former Soviet space, it's different enough where things challenge you a little bit, which I really enjoy. So Georgia would be my go-to. So have you been to any uh, former Soviet states that really are sort of dangerous, sketchy places? Um, well, I was in Tajikistan in 2002, so right after the Americans went in and overthrew the Taliban, and that was probably pretty sketchy. I, I mean, a lot matters who you're with, a lot is luck, uh, but I was on this route out of Af the, the number one heroin route out of Afghanistan, and because the fall of the Taliban, heroin exports were like doubled overnight, or however long it takes to grow a, a crop of heroin. And you had all these Russian bases because Russia and Tajikistan have a close political alliance. These Russian bases were set up to stop the heroin flow, but really they were all in on it. So you have the Soviet coppers, you know, the Russian helicopters coming in at night and taking large quantities of this heroin out. And you have all these checkpoints where I think if you were the biggest screw up in the Russian army, you got sent to Tajikistan at one of these remote checkpoints. And these guys were just excited to see somebody. So you'd have to check in, you'd have to go into the base, check in with them. And then there was this weird, like, hey, we're friends and we're all cool, but you can't really go yet. We're going to hang out for a while. And that meant drinking vodka, firing AKs. It's just these surreal experiences with these massive mountains and deep blue skies and yeah, maybe that was dangerous. Uh, my taxi driver on a 17-hour drive almost crashed us into the river, and there are all these uh, – basically, the heroin is getting across the river through tires being swam across or actually thrown across, and there's this game. So on the Afghan side, you could see the drug lords had their the lights, the generators. That means they had money. Um, and then on the, the Tajik side, there are Tajik and Russian troops hunkered in, like on the cliff sides and like – packed together and they're just waiting for this this product to come across or, or these smugglers to come across. And that wasn't a safe zone, I don't think. I got stuck in the mountains for a week. Um, so that was probably the sketchiest, but I don't think it's like that now. So recently you made some videos as well in the neighboring Kyrgyzstan. Um, yeah. Kyrgyzstan seems like a, a quite interesting place because it's it's completely off the beaten path for tourists, uh, at least Western tourists. Um, what were some of your experiences there? Uh, Bishkek's a funky little a funky city. I like it. It's got this um, this Soviet feel to it a bit, but then it has these massive, I don't know, in uh, roughly the elevation, but maybe eighteen thousand foot mountains behind the city. The people are cool. Uh, the people are very friendly open, nice. It's a very sleepy place. And then you have Lake Isikul. And Lake Isikul, I don't know if you've been to Lake Tahoe in California, it's like that times 10. So this massive transparent watered lake with rimmed with mountains. Very beautiful. Some of the most be beautiful landscapes I've seen, actually. 
And you've also been to um, Kazakhstan. And in your video where you were in the capital, you pointed out how you were surprised at how clean and developed and how high quality the infrastructure was in, in Kazakhstan. Yeah, it was interesting because coming from Ukraine where, well, none of the money really hits the, the ground, let's say, like into the roads and the infrastructure or anything. In Kazakhstan, that oil revenue, while it is, I'm sure, a very corrupt country, at least some of it is getting on the street, you know, to the street level. And there are a lot of restaurants opening up. So there's enough there's enough oil revenue and enough industry built around it where in Almaty, at least in the center, it seems like it's doing pretty well. Uh, and you can see it. It's very visible because um, the government's, you know, building out its infrastructure. Now, if you go to the country side, it's a totally different story. Yeah, yeah, it typically is with these countries. Um, do you think that Central Asia is going to become a, a major hub of growth and economic activity over the next few years? Uh, that's well, all the countries are different. So if you take uh, Kazakhstan and, and Turkmenistan, those are two different universes. Yes, they have, they're both in the Soviet space. Yes, they're like similar because the Soviets you know, ran all that, the Central Asia for 70 years, there's some common threads. But as far as where the countries are now, they're in completely different spaces. I've heard Uzbekistan is opening up a lot um, for entrepreneurship. They're removing a lot of restriction, a lot of red tape. But as far as, do I see this play, the, the region as like a economic powerhouse or a big place to grow for growth? Mm, that's a tough one. I mean, Kyrgyzstan is... It's a bit broken. Like the infrastructure there is not doing so well. So when you go to Kazakhstan, to Kyrgyzstan, it's it's much different. And then I I strongly believe work ethic has a lot to do with things. And like if a country is going to move in a good direction economically, um, that's a tough one. I don't know. Maybe maybe I mean I know there's car manufacturing in Uzbekistan, but as far as like tech moving in or something i don't know what countries have you been to which you think are going to have some of the best economic growth prospects well i'm living in ukraine right now in ukraine it's it's the population's going down it's an aging population but in kiev the capital it's it's the population's increasing and there are more business opportunities just in my Little time I've lived there in three years, you can see there's a lot of development in the tech space. Now there's a lot of outsourcing. That's the biggest um, component. I mean, biggest slice of the pie in regards to the tech space there. And VC, angel and VC funding is not really baked into the DNA there. That's that's a high risk, high trust uh, way of, of investing. And Ukraine's a place where well, there's low trust in a business sense, and you want to get your money as quick as you can and get it out or, or bury it somewhere. I mean, that's really the mentality there. So I think it's changing, but those cultural changes need to take time. So I've, I've, I, the country is getting better economically right now with the new administration. So maybe maybe ukraine and maybe it's maybe it's keith maybe it's the capital I'm not saying all of ukraine by any stretch um that could be one and I, i'm sorry the question was in the former soviet space or all the world that i've seen oh no no I, I just meant sort of um interesting countries anywhere in the world okay well i was just in saudi arabia i just did a 11 part series there and that was interesting seeing the startup development in a lot of um new entrepreneurs let's say because it's let's just call it what it is i mean it's been blessed with this oil revenue so a lot of the young people have not been known for their their uh, go get it men work mentality okay there are always exceptions um but this is what i've been told was told from saudis it was like okay your education's taken care of things are sort of taken care of you're gonna go get a state job or work for the bank or whatever and now that's changing um, I did a video on women entrepreneurs there and a lot of very clever 
forward thinking driven woman starting businesses in Saudi. And the government's really backing it right now. So and taxes are very low. Yeah, that's that's a, another aspect of, of Middle Eastern countries that's quite interesting. Um, we were at a special economic zone conference in, in Barcelona. And uh -huh. the amount of women from Middle Eastern countries who are extremely competent at a very high level uh, working on these business projects is something that really, I think, surprises and confuses um, yes. say, Americans who have this like post 9-11 uh, bias and about, about, about the Middle East. Exactly. And I'd, uh, I interviewed one woman in my video who's saying there were actually, I think, I think she said, I got this right, there were more female tech startup founders that were than, than male, which I almost didn't believe because in the tech world, it's definitely the opposite usually. Yeah, yeah. And another aspect about Saudi Arabia that I thought was was quite interesting is that when most Americans from a just a visual perspective imagine Saudi Arabia, they just imagine sort of this sand and desert and rocks maybe. But mm -hmm. um, you visited, for example, Al Sheikh, which is uh, uh, the, the Grand Canyon of Saudi Arabia, as you described it aptly. Um, right. And... Uh, I think just showing people uh, on camera that there's green areas and, and very fertile areas within Saudi Arabia is is also kind of a paradigm shift. For sure. Yeah, it was a surprise to me seeing the uh, the southwestern corner on the Yemeni border. It's very green, mountainous. It almost had a climate like San Francisco. The fog would come in, keep everything green. And it was cool because it was up at altitude. So yeah, that's definitely not the sand and heat we think of. Okay, to be fair, most of the country is desert, but there are definitely, it's it's quite a mixed up place geographically and culturally. I mean, just there's great distances between things and it's really a regionalized country. It's not, one, there's no one Saudi identity by any stretch. So when you're in Jeddah, you're gonna see women without head coverings. I didn't think I would see that. You know, and uh, like the majority almost, I would like to say. And now it's not law. I mean, in Riyadh, you'll see that also. Riyadh is but is, is traditionally more conservative. Uh, and then you'll go to some places where women are in full cover. And that's like culturally what they should be doing in that region or that town. And so it really varies wherever you are there. Did you stop by Mecca uh, when you're near Jeddah? No, I didn't. So... Westerners, I mean, non-Muslims are not allowed in, in inside like the old areas of Mecca and Medina. So I didn't, I didn't bother going. Right, right. Um, so another aspect about Saudi Arabia, and, and you talk about this a lot um, in your videos, and it's, it's kind of sad that you have to preface it this way. But you always say this is about Saudi people, not Saudi politics. Um, right. You get a lot of like hate mail from people who are, say, very opposed from the, uh, to the Saudi government or people maybe who have had, um, who are Saudis, who have, you know, had a, a oppressive experiences with the government saying, hey, why don't you talk about, like, you know, the, the executions and all of that? Sure. Yeah, I get plenty of that. So that's the point I've prefaced my videos that way is because, Look, there are many narratives going on at the same time. Yeah, um, Khashoggi or, you know, all the heinous things that have happened in Saudi, right? Like that, those, those happen and they get a lot of exposure and a lot of coverage. Now there's another story like women building businesses that doesn't get nearly as much coverage. And I think it's unfair that those women or the people that are doing cool things in their lives that are good people, aren't allowed a voice because of, of what government is doing or what policies are being pushed forward. And then you can break it down like, okay, so is is America 100% innocent in the world with everything it does? And do I want to be labeled through the Iraqi evasion? Is that who I am? You know, so I think uh, it, these are all complicated topics, but I try to break away the political narrative and the human narrative in my videos. So I, you know, the second I say uh, 
you know, go into politics immediately, I instantly alienate half the audience and then I trigger people and it just turns into a political dialogue. And I, there's just enough of that online. You know, I would rather show this guy's story who I got into his house in this remote town in Saudi and show his life and how he looks at the world. And I think that's my strength versus just talking about, you know, Saudi politics. And it did, just because I go to Saudi doesn't mean I agree with uh, MBS and everything by any stretch. No, it, doesn't, it has nothing to do with, with that. And I also, the, the reality is most young people in Saudi, if they're, say, educated, you know, wanting to build their futures in, in a modern way, they love MBS because he's made their lives better. A very simple, it's like whoever makes, it's very human, whoever makes your life better, you're going to like. And so by making their lives better, meaning they can now go to cinema. And now in the West, we think, what? Cinema? That's making your life better? Yeah, well, when you don't go, you're not allowed to go to the movies. And all of a sudden, someone allows you to go to the movies. It's a big deal. Or they tried to bring a Nicki Minaj concert in, which is crazy to me. And they allowed women to drive. They allowed women to drive. And so the cases of the women that were imprisoned, tortured, all these things for driving, well, they did it before that was enacted into law. So it's the Middle East, it's Saudi, it's hardball. It's not a soft place politically. So that was a message from the government saying, hey, no, you don't do it on your terms. You do it on our terms, right? And I'm not saying I agree or disagree with any of this stuff. That's not that's not the point of what I'm doing. The point is to show these other narratives. So every American or every Westerner or doesn't think, uh, you know, in Saudi Arabia, they're going to behead you or hate you for being a Westerner or any of this stuff, which is totally false. And that's what everyone says. Are you going to Saudi? Be careful. You'll be beheaded. It's very dangerous. So that's the whole point of what I'm doing is just to show this other narrative. Yeah, yeah. And um, one sort of ridiculous narrative that you hear, I I don't hear a lot from Western Europeans, but I hear it a lot from Americans is, oh, well, they have a bad government. Why don't they overthrow their government? But if you reverse the question, you know, if you have an Iraqi asking an American, (laughs) oh, well, you disagree with the Iraq war and you don't like uh, George Bush, why don't you overthrow the U.S. government? then you can see just how ridiculous those kind of arguments sound. Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. And I'd like to ask anyone who says, oh, just overthrow the government, A, like it's an easy thing to do. Secondly, do you want to sacrifice your wife's safety, your kids' safety, like actually their ability to live in this world by going up against a regime that doesn't play easy, that, you know, also, try to overthrow the American government. I don't think the American government would play easy on you either. It's just like, try to overthrow any government. It's not, it's, it's so easy to say that, but I get that a lot in Iran. I did a series in Iran and they're, why don't yeah, they just overthrow to talk about. Yeah, why don't they just overthrow the government? I'm like, that government is good at what it does. Like, they have that place on lockdown. Yes, there are, there are uprisings and there are protests, but it's, again, do you want to wake up tomorrow and go against the government and, you know, risk losing everything you have, your family's life, your life. So in three, two generations, they can live a different reality. Some people have that courage and passion, uh, uh, but most don't, I don't think. Yeah. So you were there in, um, in, in March 2019. Is that correct? In, uh, in Iraq? I mean, Iran? Yeah. I was there in, um, I'm sorry, I was there in 18, the end of 2018. I see, I see. And your videos got, got posted a bit later. Okay, so um, you, got, you got quite lucky. Um, you, you were actually there around the same time my mom was there. But, um, okay. but you got quite lucky because you were there right before the whole uh, uh, escalation with the United States and the issue with the tankers and all of that, that trouble. Um, did you have any sort of uh, uh, sign that there was going to be trouble ahead from a perspective of traveling there? Well, when I went, um, 
was sort of a difficult time because the sanctions really got ramped up. So economically, the country was and is is now so more hurting very much. You know, as people's chicken prices doubled in five months, their currency went to to nothing. So they were feeling the hurt pretty hard. Um, and this is when Trump was in office, obviously. So it wasn't it wasn't the easiest shoe as far as making videos, that's for sure. But uh, the P, I mean, I got what I wanted to get, which is to show the story of the people there, which zero animosity for being an American, none. Which yeah. I find to be so interesting. You go to the Middle East, you go to the parts of the Middle East that are getting totally hosed by U.S. foreign policy. They're getting hosed by their own government. They're getting hosed by Western governments. And you'd think those would be the places where they'd want to just say, you effing American, get out of here. And it's never happened. And if I want that treatment, which has happened very little in my life, I've had very little problems, but I'd go to the UK for that, which is crazy. Yeah, I, I was I was about to say that um, I've seen more of that in France than <laughs> yeah. elsewhere. It's unbelievable. And I, I mean, I completely really get the sentiment, though. What in the in France or the UK? Oh, wherever you know, it's. I don't. I don't get the sentiment because I think it's an unevolved person who can't distinguish between a, a person of a country and the government or their policies of the country. And if if you start judging people off of okay who their leader is on an individual basis, like I am Donald Trump all of a sudden, then that's just that's just it's unfair and unreal. So I think. That's what I try to do in my content. Look, I am not my government. I don't want to be associated with my government. There's some people in government I agree with, but the vast majority, I think their values are flawed and I, I don't really uh, connect myself with in any way, shape or form. So why do we live in a world why, you know, where it's the government is the people. And that's a lot of the West looks at Iran. Oh, the Iranians, they all hate, you know, it's just putting it under one label. Iran is their government and, and, Iranians are the government. No, it's they're not. Some people agree with the government there, but not all, that's for sure. So what are some interesting aspects of traveling to Iran, some particularly interesting insights or things that you saw there? Oh, it's, it's a fascinating country. It's my second time there. I, I think the first shock that comes is the first time you were there? It was the second time I was there. When, 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 when was the first oh, when, time? Oh, when was the first time? It was like uh, four years ago. Right. And that was when I came back from that trip and I was telling people, guys, you don't understand. This country is amazing. And everyone looked at me like I was crazy. I'm like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll make videos of the place and then show. And that's more effective when you can make videos. So the first thing people will notice is you think Iran is totally broken and, and – uh, dysfunctional and the roads at least in the between the big cities are are great the intercountry flights are great the trains the whole infrastructure is built out way better than anyone would imagine i'm not saying it's uh switzerland but it's for that region and what you might think it's 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 good and then you realize it's a very safe country it's it's very safe to to live in Iran. Okay, shout out against the government and it becomes dangerous quickly. But if you want to live a normal life there, it's like they look around at their neighbors and they're like, whoa, we're actually, you know, your kids can walk to school okay and not have any issues. It's like a, a high trust society that, that doesn't have a lot of petty crime and you don't really have to worry about getting burglarized or anything like that. Yeah, true. It does happen though. And my camera was stolen. Uh, I lost four days of footage and um, it was stolen and that can happen in France or anywhere, but I have some theories behind that. I don't want to go into on this, this, uh, podcast, but, uh, it can happen, but petty crime is very low. It's just, it's way safer. I'd say Tehran is much safer than a, than a Western city. Right. Right. So, um, in terms of uh, uh, traveling, what are some other countries? Because 
I think you only started making videos like maybe two, two, three years ago, right? What mm -hmm. are some other countries that you've been to off the air that you think are, are particularly noteworthy or interesting? Okay, interesting from a travel perspective or from yeah, a from business? Yeah, travel perspective. You know, say uh, there's, there's an American 24 to 26 year old who wants to do the same thing that you're doing, um, that you did. Yeah, I think the, we've already talked a bit about it, but the former Soviet space is very interesting and there are 15 countries in that space. So if it's Tajikistan or Kyrgyzstan or Georgia or even Estonia, if you go to Estonia, it's like you're in this modern tech driven culture where everyone looks, you know, Finnish. It's, it's right there basically geographically. And so you, you look at that space and you're like, how, how did they keep it all together? That's insane. The Tajiks and the Estonians under one country, basically, right? And like based yeah. out of everything run out of the nerve center being Moscow. Like how did they keep those people together? Oh, they did it through repression. I got that. But still, it's even amazing that it was all part of one union. So I think the former Soviet space is super interesting. I really like the Middle East a lot. And I, for example, I, I recommend Turkey a lot to people. If they want, I get people ask me, we want to travel, but not just do a typical Western European trip, but not too adventurous, you know, where things function pretty well. Go to Istanbul. That's a that's one of my favorite cities on the planet. And Turkey, Turkey functions well. Safe country. It's so delicious. Food's amazing. Infrastructure works well. And that's sort of like that's sort of like, um, let's say, like Middle East. It's not really the. It's Middle East where Middle East meets Europe. So it's it's you're sort of flirting with what the Middle East is like a bit. And then I've found the Middle East to just be one of the coolest regions of the world. And ironically enough, that's where you'll have the most people showing their hospitality. Like as hospitality is in all parts of the world. And if you go in cool and not like an arrogant ass or anything, then people are very cool. And that's everywhere. That's uniform. But the Middle East, it's it's on steroids. People will invite you into their homes for meals. I wouldn't go to Syria now, but I would go to Syria now, actually. Damascus is fine. But when I was in Syria before the war, that was a that was an unbelievable experience. Just being invited in to everywhere. And so countries like well, Saudi's interesting now because it just opened up. Tourism visas just opened up on September 27th of 2019. So that's relatively new. Iran, I mean, if you're American, you have to go on a, a group tour, unfortunately. But I, I'd say it's still worth it. And I don't know the situation exactly at this very moment. Um, Jordan's interesting. Israel's interesting because there's so much going on and so much that's gone on there historically with the religions. Uh, but the whole region is fascinating. And then I've done, I lived in Asia. Um, I'm sort of off the Asian thing right now. Not to say I'm not interested, but traveling. I just don't feel like being in super hot tropical places at the moment. You were, I guess, in, uh, in like Vietnam, Thailand, somewhere like that? Yeah, I used to live in Bangkok, but I've traveled Vietnam extensively. And Vietnam's my favorite country in Asia. I'd say Vietnam or Indonesia. Indonesia is just... 16,800 islands, 8,000 are um, inhabited. So that's like you could spend your world, your whole life traveling in Indonesia and not even see it all. And not just Bali. Everyone just goes to Bali. And that's a nice, comfortable vacation. But Indonesia is much more than Bali. Right, right. So um, I want to start wrapping up. But sure. um, before, can you tell me a bit about some of the upcoming projects that you're working on, um, what, where, where are you going to go next as of uh, the recording of this? Okay, uh, today I just started editing my Indian series that will be like a 10 part series. And then Pakistan, I went to Pakistan. So I'll be editing that afterwards. That was, that was amazing. That's, um, that's one to put on the list. And I'm just gonna talk about it quickly about this one valley, sort of famous valley, Hunza Valley. Uh, rumors have it Alexander Great made it that far. Other rumors are the Persians defected from the army and, and, and you know, had a bunch of kids there. But you'll see white people with red hair, blue eyes. You'll see everything. And in this valley, the level of English 
I've never seen at such a high level, and I'm talking uniformly with the old people. All the older people I ran into spoke good English. Is that is the uh, old British influence? Some of the British influence, but if you go to other parts of Pakistan in remote areas, you're not going to see that. So a lot of it has to do with the Aga Khan Foundation, which is a massive foundation that set up schools and hospitals. And, you know, it's dealt with tourism for many years. So uh, it's, it's a fascinating place. And so Pakistan, you get into a big Pakistani city like uh, Lahore or Karachi, those are grinding places. And they're worth seeing. And there's some very interesting components. They're not easy places. But when you get into Hunza Valley, it's like, you know, it's the start of the Hindu, the Hindu Kush mountains, start of the Himalayas, really. And beautiful mountains, beautiful people, very cool. Um, so that's the Syria, India, Pakistan. And then I haven't planned out this next year of travel. I'll be unleashing these episodes for the next few months. But it'll probably be maybe um, Palestinian territories, Israel, and uh, Lebanon, those are highly on the list. And then Armenia, because I'm living in Ukraine, I'm just going to do a bunch of shorter trips like Armenia, Moldova, probably Russia. Those are the ones that are on the top of the radar right now. Yeah, I was just wondering, um, have you considered going to any of the uh, separatist regions like uh, Transnistria and Moldova or Abkhazia, Ossetia, et cetera? For sure. For sure. I don't know what it's like to get up Kazi right now. I think you have to go through Russia and South Ossetia. I would be definitely interested in um, touching on those places. But I live in Ukraine. You have to go through Russia. I don't, I'd have to like yeah, research a little bit harder right now. So um, to conclude, uh, I'm going to link to, you know, your, your YouTube channel, Instagram, Patreon in the description, et cetera. Um, Thank you. Is there anything else that our, our, our listeners should go see if they want to check out some of your work? Most of my stuff is video-based now, so it's on my YouTube. I do have a website, petersantanella.com. That's sort of the grounding place for everything. Um, and Patreon is, is, is uh, you know, if someone wants to contribute, be part of the, part of the mission, let's say, um, if they like the videos. Other than that, that's pretty much it. I don't use Twitter, really, even though I have an account. Um, so those are the places, yeah. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Tiba. Appreciate it. I would like to, once again, thank Peter Sanatello for coming on to the Geoeconomics podcast. I would also like to thank you, our listeners. This podcast is licensed under Creative Commons with Attribution. Our listeners should feel welcome to re-upload, share, edit, remix, or use this podcast for any purpose. This podcast is brought to you by the Adrianople Group. The Adrianople Group is a business intelligence and marketing firm which specializes in providing services to economic zones and charter cities. For more information, please visit the links attached below.